Okay, good evening everyone. Welcome back to our live broadcast. Sort of the time for all of us to act together as a community, to come together as a community. Take the time to reflect on our practice. my teachers used to say, or as you, you often hear monks in Thailand say, Kit Ban Chi, Kit Ban Chi, which is a colloquialism for looking at our bank account or calculating our bank, calculating our profit. Looking at what we've, get, we've gotten out of the practice, what's come of our practice, what we've gained from the practice. We come together to get direction on our practice, to direct us in the right direction, to adjust our focus but we also come together to talk about what we've gained from the practice it's a subject of constant concern right what am I getting out of this you have to look at the bottom line you put in a lot of effort what good is it? What good does it do? The Buddhism is all about cause and effect, results, actions and their results. Kamma is actions, vipaka means results. So we have results of many different things. First of all, there's the results of results of our ordinary efforts to try and solve our problems. When something comes to mind that is undesirable, we work very hard to avoid it, to quench it or quelch it, to be free from it. When something good comes to mind, the actions are to obtain it, to sustain it, to maintain it, to get what we want, to always get what we want. And we have strategies for this. We have, as I was talking about yesterday, we have ways of thinking positive or ways of setting up our lives in such a way that we are protected from the things that we don't like. And that we're able to protect the things that we do like so that we can obtain and, and experience them frequently, repeatedly, at our pleasure. And this is the worst thing to do, of course. This is what we're starting to realize through the practice. This is the, where disaster comes. If you spend all your time cultivating this attachment and aversion, these habits of avoiding the unpleasant and obtaining the pleasant, 
highly unstable. It's the sort of thing that can come crashing down on you and when your defenses are down. It can lead to great stress and suffering. When you don't get what you want, when you get what you don't want. And we're learning about these habits when we practice. As you begin to meditate, you start to see these habits, these strategies, these practices, and you realize it's not really the best way. The results are not so good. Another strategy, of course, is to cultivate tranquility meditation. So we, we cultivate states and habits that replace our reactions. Sort of avoid the problem entirely, right? So if you're angry at someone, immerse yourself in universal love. And the problem never comes up. Spend time sitting, cultivating love for all beings, love for those that you hate. It's a great method. Works wonders. If you have lust, passion for the bod for bodily, carnal pleasure, cultivate mindfulness of the body. Look at the different body parts and see them as unpleasant, as disgusting, as not worth clinging to, and it suppresses the desire, it replaces it with a sobering uh, awareness of the true nature of the body as not being in any way desirable or worthy of clinging to, and so on. There's, of course, the more universal meditations like fixing your mind on a, on a color, for example, or any sort of concept, meditating on the Buddha, for example. And these have much better results. The results here are lasting, stable, and uh, unadulterated, they're, they're not tainted by uh, defilement. So when you stop practicing, you're not any worse off than you were before. You're in fact better because you now have this skill, this talent of entering into these states. And so it's a great thing to do. People often wonder about this sort of meditation, whether it's actually any good or any use. Well, this is the use. It, it, provides you with a way out, provides you with a sort of a freedom from suffering. And yet, and yet it too is not permanent. And so as great of a temporary solution as it might be, it's not by any means a permanent solution. It can't actually free you from suffering. Because when you, when and if you ever stop or lose uh, you lose the, the interest or the initiative or the impulsion to continue, you just wind up where you started. You know, you begin to cultivate bad habits again or your bad habits crop up again. So even that's not the solution. Good results, but not the not the results we're looking for. So we go further. This is really why we we bother to torture ourselves with insight meditation. Because we see there's got to be a, a, a more 
permanent solution, right? A more stable solution, something that can allow us to truly change and truly become free and so cultivate insight meditation. Now, insight meditation has this great power of, of universal applicability. It's not just when you're angry you have you cultivate love or when you're passionate or lustful you cultivate um, mindfulness of the body or so on. Insight meditation cultivates wisdom, and wisdom gives you an understanding of, of all aspects of reality that frees you from clinging. It's an awareness, a, a presence. It's like a, um, a solution, a solvent that dissolves all of the stickiness in the mind. far more lasting and, and stable uh, and, and requires so much less effort to upkeep because it's innate, it's, it's, it's pure. It's not based on effort per se, it's based on wisdom, so meaning it's not something you have to force, it's not artificial, it's natural. Now that being said, like something that is not acknowledged nearly enough, is that even insight is not permanent. Even insight, having been gained, can be lost. A person on the, on the path of insight can gain profound insights into reality and think maybe they've really succeeded in the practice, only to fall away when they give up the practice and lose everything they've gained. It makes one kind of thing, well, why, why go through all the effort? Hey, maybe I'll go back to Samatha meditation if that's the case. I thought this was going to be a one-time thing where I don't have to go through all the torture of actually dealing with my problems and figuring them out. I'm just going to get them all back again. But it, it, to be honest, it, it probably lasts a lot longer and it's a lot more stable. It's the most stable of them all, of all of them all so far. That's not permanent. This life, maybe you keep it, if you get really strong insight, there are certain things that you won't lose throughout your life. But you can lose them in the next life or the next life or some life in the future. They're not permanent. But not to despair, there is light at the end of the tunnel, and in fact, insight meditation leads to something else. It leads to freedom, it leads to Nibbana, it leads to the experience of what we call the deathless, um, or the unarisen, perhaps. It leads to an experience that is outside of samsara. And so we have to be we have to distinguish between these two. Being on the path of insight is not enough. It's not something you accumulate and never lose. It's something you accumulate. And if you accumulate enough of it, you can break through to the point where you reach the uh, another level of 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 action. With another level of result. So the results of insight are, are stable and lasting, but not permanent. But the results of Nibbāna, the results of entering into the Magganyāna, Palanyāna, of, of, of experiencing Nibbāna, even just a moment, even for just three moments of time, that's apparently how the shortest amount of time you can experience Nibbāna, or something, or maybe two moments. But for the first time, I think it's three. Of course, it can be longer, it can be hours or days. But even for just that moment, 
this is, and again, it requires perhaps a little faith, but something you can verify for yourself, that this state is, is it's the point of no return. You can't go back. A person who has seen Nibbana, even for just a moment, will be changed permanently. Permanently, they've, they've, they've set in motion the cessation of suffering, the escape from samsara. They have permanently altered and removed from them, from their very being, sort of the linchpin to this whole mass of suffering, ignorance. They've come to see outside samsara. And this was this uh, happiness, this peace, this great freedom is 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 lasting. There's no there's no return from it. So to be clear, our our daily practice of meditation is great. It's lasting. It's great, quite beneficial, and it is what eventually leads to true freedom. But it's not true freedom. To truly be free and to have a perfect release. You need to truly understand samsara. You need to get to the point where you really get it, where you have this epiphany that tells you that nothing is worth clinging to, that ceases, where the mind drops out, unplugs, ceases to reach out, ceases to advert to samsara and there's an experience that is beyond samsara that is outside of it from that moment on one is called a sotapanna which means they have attained the stream they have entered into the stream meaning they're on the current leading them to complete freedom from suffering so doesn't mean to say that we should not all be uh, praised and appreciated for all the good merit that we're gaining in our practices of all sorts. We practice the Buddhist teaching on all levels, but it's a reminder for us not to be complacent, that there is a goal, that this isn't just a hobby or something that you take up to do on a daily basis. It's something that you use to achieve true understanding and, and realization of the ultimate state and the ultimate freedom. That's what we're aiming for. It has the greatest result, the greatest effect, and has a true a true benefit, a true purpose, true meaning. There you go. There's our Dhamma for today. The results. Getting results. Thank you all for tuning in. For coming out. Have a good day.